Value objects are one of the most popular tactical patterns of domain-driven design, and we use them to solve primitive obsession. But value objects have a big problem when working with EF Core, and that's what I'm going to show you in this video. I'm going to start from a simple example with a user entity that only has an identifier and an email, which is a primitive type. The problem with primitive types is that you can't use them to express your rich business rules. So you will end up writing some code to validate the email or enforce any other constraints that you need inside of your use cases or application services. Value objects allow you to move this problem into the domain. Now we're going to explore how in just a moment, but let's take a look at what querying this entity looks like with EF Core. I have the users controller here with just a simple method that allows me to either filter my users based on their email address where I'm using the contains method and EF Core knows how to translate this statement into a SQL query. I can also specify an exact match filter where I'm directly matching the email's value to the exact match query. So let me start the application and show you what this looks like. I will send two requests to my API. The first one is going to search for the users based on the search term. And the second one is going to do an exact match on the user's email. So these are the two queries. Now I'll jump into the Aspire dashboard and let's examine the distributed traces. I'm interested in the SQL query that we are sending to the database. Here is the exact SQL, and this query here is using the like operator, which is how the contains method is translated from link. If we take a look at our second trace and examine the SQL query, so let me open this up, you can see that we have an exact match on the email. So everything works fine when we have just primitive types. But now, let's say I want to introduce a value object to represent my email. So I'll create a record because I want my value objects to have structural equality. And this is what records give me out of the box. And inside of it, I'm going to wrap the actual email value. I'll make this a read-only property. And I'm going to define a helper method. It's going to allow me to check if a given email is valid. You can decide how you want to implement this logic. Let's say I want to create a new mail address. There's a built-in type in .NET called a mail address. It's in the system net mail namespace, and I can specify my email here and see if I get back the same address. This is going to do some validations under the hood, and it may throw an exception. So I'm going to return false in case we do have an exception, and I'm just going to swallow the exception details. So this could be a simple way to validate if an email is valid. Now let's also expose a constructor so that we can initialize the email. And then let's do some additional checks. If the value is null or white space, we can throw a new argument null exception. I'm going to specify the parameter name and the message will be the email cannot be empty. Let's also use the second method that we created, which allows us to check if the email is valid or not. So if the email or rather the email value is not valid, then we're going to throw a new argument exception. And I'm just going to say invalid email format. And then let's specify the parameter name. And after we satisfy the preconditions, I'm going to assign the value to the respective property. And now this allows me to encapsulate my primitive type with a strongly typed email record, which also contains my validations and prevents me from creating an invalid email. And this type is also immutable, so I can't change it. Now, the next thing I need to do is to update my type from a string in the user entity to be the email value object. And now this introduces a couple of problems. First of all, the queries that we had in the user's controller will no longer compile. I can fix this by just accessing the value property and using that to call the contains method and specify the search term or to perform the exact match filter. I will also have to fix my data seeding logic. So I'll have to wrap this in the email constructor. And after I fix this, what remains is to tell EF Core how I actually want to map this property. As it's no longer a primitive type, EF Core won't be able to quite figure it out on its own. So I'll have to specify the property. And let's say I access the email property. What I can do here is define a value conversion. And this is a very typical approach of how you can map simple value objects. So I'll say that when we are mapping to the database, you should use the email's value 
to store that in the database. And when you are mapping from the database into my object model, you're going to initialize a new email. So now EF Core knows how to persist the email value object. So let's start the application and execute our queries. If I try and send a request to fetch the users using the search term query parameter, you will see that we're going to run into an exception. And the exception says that EF Core isn't able to translate the specific expression where we are checking if the email value contains our search term parameter. So EF gives us a couple of suggestions to rewrite this query in a form that can be translated, and we're going to discuss what that is, or we can switch to client-side evaluation, which is going to load the entire database and then perform the filtering. So we want to avoid this. We have the same problem in the exact match filter. So let me send this request and you'll see that we are getting the same exception, even when we want to do an exact match on the email value. So this is a drawback of using value objects. EF Core will stop behaving nicely with your link queries. So how can you solve this? With the exact match query, we can solve this by comparing the email to a value object instance. So if you do something like this, the query will compile and you'll be able to fetch your users using the exact match approach. Now, this won't work when I try to use the contains method because it isn't defined on the email value object and EF Core wouldn't know how to translate it into SQL even if it were. So let's revert this to the previous solution that we had accessing the value property and then performing our queries on this. The key for making this work is for EF Core to know how to access the primitive type, which is the string value that we are wrapping behind this property. So there is a way to define a custom database function with EF Core, and this is one approach we can use to solve this problem. So I'm going to define a static class, which I will call email extensions. And inside of it, I'm going to define a static method Let's call it unwrap. And this is going to be an extension method on the email type. However, instead of implementing this method, what we have to do is just throw a new not implemented exception. Essentially, we don't want to implement this. Now, I'm also going to make this a nullable email argument. So now that we have this extension method, what do we do with it? Well, inside of the model builder, you can call the has db function method. And here, you can provide an expression that's going to return the function that you want to define. So we want to define the email extensions unwrap function with the default arguments. And then we want to configure this a bit more. There are a couple of methods that you can call. The most important one is has translation. So let's see how we could define this. We need to return a new SQL function expression. And this allows me to define how we of course will map the type returned here into a SQL function. Now, I don't really want to use a SQL function. So for the function name argument, I'm just going to specify an empty string. For the actual argument values, I'm going to specify what we already had. For the nullable argument, I'm going to specify false. And there's also an array which tells if our arguments propagate nullability. I'm also going to specify false. And this array should have the same number of elements as the number of parameters you're passing to the function. In our case, this is just going to be the email value. So I'm going to specify one element. Then I need to specify the type, which is going to be string. And I'm going to specify null for the type mapping argument. A few more things I need to specify are the parameter name which is email, and this is the same value as my database function here. And I can also specify the database type using the has store type method. And because I'm using Postgres, I'm going to specify text for the email argument. So this is how we can tell EF Core to define a custom database function, which is going to allow me to work with the email value object. And now EF Core will know how to convert this type into a string. And now we only have to tweak the method call here to use the unwrap method instead of accessing the value. And now when I start the application and I go ahead and send my two API requests, you will see that we are receiving the same response back. So our EF core queries are now working the same as before. If we take a look at the SQL query, you will see that the translation is the same. We're doing a like operator on the email column and specifying the search term parameter. The same goes for the other query that we have, where we are checking if the email is an exact match on the argument that we are specifying. But at this point, we have to ask ourselves if this approach is worth it. In my opinion, you're really fighting against EF Core 
while trying to use value objects. And these two concerns aren't the same thing. With a value object, we are concerned with expressing some business rules in our domain through a type instead of using a primitive value. So that's the main reason for using value objects. With EF core, we are dealing with persistence and these two things tend to go against each other. So what I would normally suggest is to simply not fight against EF core. Use a primitive type in the database and figure out a way how you can map that from the database into your object model. If you don't want to define a database function, there's an alternative approach that we can explore. And instead of using a conversion to define the email property, we can say that the user object owns an email type. And this is going to behave the same from a persistence perspective. So we're still going to end up with EF core persisting our object in the same database table. But this time when I start the application, I get an exception that there's no suitable constructor for the email entity. And the reason for this is because I don't have a setter on the value property. I can use an init setter or a private setter and EF core will be able to figure this out. But after I solve this, I should be able to send my API requests and receive a response back. So when using own types, the translations will work with your link query. Now, own types have their own set of issues. For example, EF core is going to attach some behavior under the hood to your own type. So one alternative you could explore is using a complex property. You'll see a similar behavior to using own types in terms of database persistence and your link queries. However, complex properties will behave more like value objects when speaking in domain-driven design terms. Now, if you enjoyed this video so far, I have just one simple ask, and that is to smash the like button under this video. And when it comes to how you'll be using value objects with EF Core, I suggest using the approach that gives you the least amount of resistance. Defining a property conversion is nice, but it introduces some problems with link queries. Using an owned entity, solves some of these problems but introduces another set of side effects when using own types and complex properties are kind of the middle ground they give you the benefits of own types but they also have some drawbacks and unsupported features if you want to learn more about domain driven design i recommend watching this video next check out my software architecture courses to improve your skills the links are going to be in the pinned comment under this video and of course until next time stay awesome